Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Wednesday morning online seminar. Today, we're looking at innovation and construction contracts, and that is going to be presented by our very own Mohammed Hack, who's consultant, barrister, adjudicator, and quantum expert. Uh, you can see those details up on the screen there. As always, uh, Mo's happy to take any questions you might have for him. Um, if you'd like to use a Q&A or chat box at the bottom of your screen there, you, we will get to these questions at the end. Alternatively, if there's something you don't really wish to ask in an open forum, Mo is always happy for you to email him, mohammedhack at silverllp.com, and he will answer that question for you. Uh, in the meantime, Mohammed, I will hand over to you. Take it away, please. Morning, and thank you, Julie, for novating me. Uh, in this uh, in this seminar uh, breakfast seminar in the morning and um, uh, welcome to all our guests uh, thank you for joining and signing up in this many numbers um, I really look forward to uh, explaining or attempt to explain uh, to you what is novation and uh, what is its um, role in a construction contract um, this is this slide is not so important. It's come something like a content. Uh, I did it when I prepared, so you don't need to know at this moment. I'll go through it anyway. But I will start in my usual fashion by defining what novation is, or better still, uh, say that by describing um, what it is. Well, I mean, novation is um, obviously a concept, but uh, in practice, but um, for our present purposes, um, this is simply a contract. Um, why I'm saying for our present purposes, uh, because um, uh, it's sort of the process it takes um, uh, in law uh, is uh, having a tri-party contract uh, and substituting one party uh, for another. Uh, so uh, how it happens, a party to an existing contract is substituted uh, through the novation contract uh, or novation agreement, or whatever way you want to call it. Um, and um, uh, what happens typically uh, from the date of novation, both the benefit of the original contract and the burdens pass under the novation contract and the new parties is kind of um, um, uh, get into uh, the, the uh, relationship uh, um, um, and uh, carry on from there on, unless um, uh, something is done for the previous uh, uh, period where the new party was not a party to this contract. Uh, so there are possibilities that the substituted party may be liable to the other party um, and also the, uh, the, the party who, um, by the other party I mean the older party and the party who remained into the contract may either be responsible for the previous uh, part which has been um, uh, done under the older contract be responsible to the older party or to the new party. It all depends how you frame your contract there because it's a contract, there isn't a, uh, a general rule that much. And um, as such, one has to be very careful because uh, uh, somebody is taking up uh, something from um, a historical contract. So it's, it's important that uh, whoever is entering into an ovation agreement understands his prospective liability uh, under the under the novation contract. Now, a typical example, because there are so many ways it might uh, happen in construction contract um, that I can't sort of describe them all um, in this uh, short uh, passage of time. But what I'll do is I'll take one or two examples, and I will try to describe. Um, or explain to you the implications. The most common one is my first example, where let's say there is an employer and, um, um, and, the, and the employer, the client um, would 
like to build a building. So the first thing they do, they go to an architect um, to build the, uh, the client's professional team. And obviously with the architect and the other professionals, the employer uh, then enters into uh, professional service contracts. And under that, let's take the example of architect. I'm not saying that's only an architect is the possibility. Rather, we'll see later on that the other uh, professionals as well uh, are, are, are appointed and then novated uh, to a main building contract. But let's say the architect um, uh, 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 develops uh, uh, the design and then the, uh, des uh, the, the scheme is tendered uh, and um, uh, a, a design and build contract is uh, uh, entered into where the contractor is responsible for designs. And for some reason or other, uh, the parties felt and they novated uh, in a, in, through a contract, the original architect to uh, with the building contractor to perform uh, the design task. You know, that's one example. It's very typical uh, uh, that it might happen. It doesn't have to be a design and build. I'm just giving an example that's have to pick up design and build to make you understand uh, why um, the architect's role um, um, or why an architect uh, is needed for the contractor uh, and, and, and just that. So it's, it doesn't have to be like that. It's just an example. But as I say, there could be other professionals who do the same. Now, just a bit of you know, expansion on my example, that contract one, well, I'm borrowing the language of Lord Denning um, in a case uh, uh, that, if I may say so, the employer and the professional architect had the contract one for professional services, and then the architect develops the design and obtains planning, then the scheme is tendered, the contractor is appointed, uh, and, uh, and, and that is contract number two. Now let's say the contract is design and build, so the contractor has a responsibility um, uh, to develop the design and complete it, it's not a turnkey, it's a design and build, meaning that there were designs initially and it was developed up to a level and a point. Um, let me turn, okay, that's I think better. Uh, uh, so there, the, the, this, this, there were designs already in existence uh, and created by the architect. And then that was um, uh, given to the contractor to develop. And now, for some reason or another, if the parties felt um, th there could be an innovation agreement, agreement through which the original architect be novated and it is, its works be novated um, um, in, 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 through a novation agreement uh, to the contractor. And um, uh, the key issue, if you are, a, if you are an, a contractor is, or representing a contractor is, uh, are you going to be responsible for the uh, for the mistakes of the professional uh, of the pre novation dates? Because you are essentially in a contract with the professional, and uh, from the day you have taken on the liability. But what if uh, there was a mistake uh, in the original contract? And why this is important, I'll get back to you later on in another slide. Um, but uh, that's more or less is the scenario. Well, I mean, to, we know that in a situation like this, uh, novation is not the only option. So I just uh, want to um, compare it with another option, which is assignment. So uh, it's, it's perfectly possible that uh, uh, the, the, either the architect or the uh, employer uh, or the client assigns the benefits of the professional service contract originally entered into um, uh, to, the, uh, to the contractor and uh, the architect carries on. I mean, it sometimes happened that uh, the contractors feel that, okay, this professional knows um, the, uh, the brief well, he worked on it. Um, it could be that uh, because it's a design and build, you don't have an architect from the employer's side. So rather than bringing in someone new, uh, why not we employ uh, the original one? 
And so uh, it could be that they want to um, get the advantage of the things what has already been done. And so an assignment is perfectly possible. But the, uh, the difference is that while novation, if it, if it actually is completed, transfers both rights and obligations of um, the parties um, into the original contract, uh, the assignment normally tends only uh, to, um, uh, tends only to um, um, transfer the burden, not the benefit. Uh, and also, uh, it's not absolutely needed, but also it's not a tripartite contract. It's only a biparty contract assignment, I mean, whereas no vision is a tripartite contract. And <clears throat> no consent, unless um, uh, it's uh, specified into the contract and which you will see normally uh, <laughs> in modern times, we, uh, when you draft, we specify that even if you're assigning it to a third party, you need the consent from the other party. That's quite a, a normal fashion, but coming to the core, legally it's not needed. But um, if you are doing an ovation, it requires consent from all the parties and you cannot normally you can assign uh, at any point in time uh, and uh, doesn't need the consent unless uh, it's there is a provision as such into the contract for novation it's other way around you just cannot turn around and say look you have to give me a consent so if you have a plan to do a novation of the existing contract and kind of, if you are an employer to bring everything under one bag, uh, if, you, if you are uh, intending it right from the day one, it's advisable that uh, you, just, um, you just make a provision in your initial professional services contract, um, in my example. And uh, uh, then the next thing is um, uh, after the consent that's uh, what actually happens in uh, a novation, sometimes we like to say that a divorce and a new marriage, you know. Uh, so uh, there were uh, parties, two parties uh, who got to a contract, let's call it a marriage. And then um, uh, with consent of these two parties, um, uh, an affair develops with one of the parties to some third party. And then uh, the, the party who's uh, not in affairs anymore with the older uh, partner just drops out and gives the consent for the partner to uh, divorce and remarry the new one. So that's, that's novation. Uh, so uh, effectively or in reality, a divorce occurs um, in contextual terms, we call it a rescission happens and then uh, is substituted by a fresh contract. And uh, in the fresh contract, the parties are new, but they uh, continue uh, to uh, act um, uh, into the role of the earlier contract, you know. Um, so the new parties continue to um, carry on the original obligations. So, um, so in building design and construction, novation normally refers to the process by which design consultants or other consultants are initially contracted to the client and then novated to the contractor. So that's, that's the scenario. Um, um, uh, if, you, if you want to have a flowchart type presentation, um, the contract one is between uh, the uh, the uh, employer or client on one side and the professionals on the other. And then there is another contract which comes between uh, the builder or the employer um, after the scheme being tendered and uh, the contractor. And then the innovation occurs that uh, into the original professional contract, uh, the employer drops out and in a tri-party contract, uh, the professional uh, uh, service provider becomes a contracting party to the contractor to provide uh, a similar uh, uh, professional services. 
Now the innovation of this employment uh, this assignment uh, slide continues. Uh, there are so many possibilities, but let's say in, in the example where we are taking, if the assignment route is taken, then the employer would normally assign the benefits of the initial design. Um, but remind you that uh, it's a contract. So uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna add a clause, uh, to uh, to for the uh, obligation to devolve as well uh, the liability to to go to the new party as well. By all means, you can make it a tri party and still call it an assignment, and uh, the liability may transfer through the express terms because that's where the party is intended. But uh, most likely than not, people will say in that case, legally speaking, it's an ovation. And as I already said, for assignment, no consent is needed at law. However, again, um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, however, again, in most cases, you will see in the modern time that we um, add a clause into a contract that before assignment, uh, a consent will be required. Now, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, that if the employer is looking for uh, or, or thinking that uh, in, in future, you will wash off its hands from the professionals and will only have um, uh, its rights and obligations against the contractor. In that case, it's best to add a clause, uh, which uh, uh, says something around, uh, something in the line of uh, the, if uh, the employer so wills or wishes, it might novate the, um, uh, the consultant uh, to the contractor or any other party he wishes, and the and the um, uh, consultant uh, will be bound to give the consent as and when requested. And uh, normally, well, it gives the lawyers a bit more money, uh, what we suggest, but that gives more comfort to the employer as well, if you are the employer, and also uh, uh, to a professional who's 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 building on it, that um, uh, that. Uh, to have a form of uh, uh, innovation agreement agreed at the time the employer and the professional is, uh, um, is uh, uh, entering into the professional services contract. And um, so, so uh, 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 two things I suggest uh, uh, to take uh, as a lesson that a, in the professional services contract, do not be silent, speak up that uh, the employer wishes to uh, novate it uh, to the contractor, B, that um, uh, the, the consent will be obligatory on the part of the architect consultant, and to make parties happier, uh, that is, they're not signing up to something blindly, uh, just add a form of a consulting agreement. You may be spending a few more pennies uh, uh, in, in drafting that, or if you don't uh, know how to do that, you know where to come to. Uh, but uh, in the end, when the actual uh, innovation takes place, your life will be easier, you know. The next slide is um, about, uh, again, uh, uh, what, what, who are the different parties and uh, what kind of a fight goes on, you know? Uh, well, the most important point I would, I would say uh, is to keep in mind uh, uh, what's the fate or what are you agreeing to about the performances that has already occurred before you come into the picture or the new party comes into the picture because under contract number one, party A was liable to party B. Now, party C comes in, the contractor comes in. Now, what is the position of uh, uh, the contract? Con what's, the, what's the position of the contractor vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, professional um, as against uh, the uh, client? What's the position of the client? If something goes wrong, who does it go to? You know, does it still go to uh, the older professional or the uh, contractor? Now, the, the 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 technique that's used, and it's it's sometimes very technical, 
and um, the express terms are very important uh, and that has to be uh, very clearly drafted, no ambiguity, uh, because at the end of the day, that document's gonna dictate uh, the fate of each of the three parties, um, meaning the two parties early and the two parties new, but there are only three parties, right? So how to, how to ensure uh, the position of each? Well, um, um, uh, employers normally, the clients, they seek a warranty from the designer, um, of, uh, which, which allows them to continue uh, to, uh, um, uh, to attach the PI of the designer if in case the contractor is not available, you know, for the uh, earlier works, as well as since it's innovation, they can, they can take, a, take a, um, uh, a warranty for the future period as well to make their position absolutely sure. There's no law which can stop them to do so. Similarly, uh, just to avoid any future confusion, the contractor may seek uh, a warranty. It's normal that they, he would seek the a warranty for uh, uh, for the prospective period of the contract uh, and the professional services, but it's not an unusual for them to seek a warranty for the previous period as well. Now, <clears throat> that's where one of the things that the designer uh, should keep in his mind that would there be a conflict of interest for him because uh, earlier stage he was working for the best interest of the employer whereas once novated he's going to work for the best interest of the contractor and how he resolves it I don't know because um, we the lawyers will probably never do that you know uh, we will not act for the first party first and then go to and act for the next party right to day one uh, we have been taught at the school that don't do it you'll have difficulties in managing the affairs, but somehow the architects and other professionals are entitled. And it's kind of a dilemma they carry uh, and how they resolve it that's, that they know best, but from purely a liability perspective, uh, they, should, they should be clear that what they're signing up to and who they're responsible to and when the warranties are concerned, uh, uh, to check them seriously before signing them, because that's where their main uh, focus should be as far as the liability, if things go wrong, is concerned. I have a case to cite that um, because uh, the, the contractor uh, has failed to uh, clarify the position, um, the, its later attempt to recover losses for pre-novation breaches, which is obviously by the, um, uh, by the consultant to the employer, uh, it uh, attempted to uh, recover that and it failed. Why it failed? Let's go to the fact a bit more. Uh, the, this, this occasion, it was not an architect, it was uh, an engineering consultant who uh, did the calculation for the prospective building scheme uh, um, of what much steel was required. And there was a mistake or um, uh, the calculation was wrong. Now, this, was, this, this structural engineer was appointed obviously by the client or the employer of the building scheme. And when, it, when the document, um, when the scheme was tendered, that mistaken calculation was part of the tender document. And um, uh, then uh, later on, uh, this mistake uh, was found out, but by then the consultant was novated uh, to the contractor. And uh, the, the, the con contract risk of uh, mistakes into the tender documents were with the contractor, quite common. Uh, we, we say that, uh, you know, it's just for the guidance only, you have to do your own examination and be responsible for it. Like it or not, that's the reality. So the contractor was responsible for the extra costs and it went to, uh, or tried to recover it um, uh, you can see the name Krillian, 
white, <laughs> it's, uh, it's no more there. Uh, so it, it, it tried to recover it um, um, uh, from the consultant uh, designer, uh, but uh, the designer was successful that under the, um, uh, to defend its position uh, by, by arguing that under the novation agreement, uh, the pre-novation uh, breaches uh, were not, were not um, uh, the responsibility of the designer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the contractor. And uh, unfortunately for the contractor, the benefit of the burden bot passed uh, so of the employer, so it failed against the employer as well, or would have failed when it tried on a, a, a different way, it would have failed anyway, because uh, the, the, the employer has washed off their hands. So it's vitally important that you understand the what obligation you are taking on and try to sort of cover your position with appropriate uh, support and warranties and all of these, both for the perspective and the retrospective part of the innovation agreement. Now, <clears throat> the next thing is normally when we come to innovation, uh, it's um, uh, the, it, there is a question associated with it is the question of form. We know that in English law, it's been, I'm talking about the English common law, the uh, normal rule is we do not have um, uh, any form prescribed at all. Um, and a contract under seal is actually not uh, enforced uh, as, as a contract uh, at all. It's, it's, it's enforced as a, because it's a deed. And because in relationships where there isn't any deed or um, um, or a written agreement, uh, if there is offer acceptance and consideration and intention to create legal relationship, the duty of the English courts historically being, or they have taken up on them, uh, that they will enforce. So there isn't normally a requirement of form, uh, but let's take uh, 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 the, the, the uh, position or discuss the position of novation. Uh, deed, do we need a deed to have an ovation? Normally the answer is don't know. If the original contract is a deed and which I tell you uh, is becoming a practice more and more because it gives the, uh, the, the party, let's say the employer, a longer period uh, to sue the other party and make him responsible. And as well, it's easier to sign or it passes on the deed, um, the benefit, it passes the benefits easily under the Law Property Act. Uh, it's, it's been a practice that more and more contracts and construction are signed as a deed. So if the original one is signed as a deed, you need a deed for novating it to a new party. So if you are asked uh, to get a novation, uh, or, or agree to an ovation, uh, please inquire and ask for the original copy of the contract which you are uh, no, getting to novated to. And if you find that the original was uh, signed as a deed, do not forget to, uh, 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 to, to make your novation agreement into a deed as well. The next option is normally it's expected that it's in writing. The three-party innovation agreement should be in writing. You know that I already discussed about the consent and all these things. How on earth you will be able to ascertain um, in, a, in a later time if any problem was there or not about the consent. So <laughs> it's a normal practice that 99% um, time uh, you'll see that innovation must be in writing, innovation must be in writing. And in my life, as a party representative or uh, as an adjudicator, uh, I found that as soon as one party says that, uh, ah, this is, uh, there is a novation, um, the other side says, no, there isn't a written, a written agreement, uh, so there isn't any proper novation. 
Now, <laughs> interestingly, uh, that's not the case. You know, the case laws are there, and I uh, cite two cases, Chess of Investments for Cousins and Enterprise Managed Services with McFadden Utilities, both are construction contracts, and in both cases, um, the court said 150 odd years ago, or slightly more than that now, uh, that a novation by conduct is perfectly possible. You know, uh, if the parties have intended well, who was that there in 1969? Can anybody imagine? I think some of you can. Lord Denning, of course. You know, uh, so uh, there was a there was a um, uh, situation where. Uh, the uh, the employer and the contractor uh, was the, the were the parties to the first contract, and then the contractor has um, has given all the benefits and the obligations of the contract to a subcontractor. Later on, the subcontractor, I think that was in 1963, uh, uh, took even the name of the contractor. Okay, sometimes it happens uh, uh, in, in merger and acquisitions of, it's more of an acquisition uh, of an older company. And um, uh, it's subject to whether the new company has taken up uh, all the obligations of the older companies in, the, in their existing contracts from the day of assignment or changing the status. Now, the subcontractor denied in a suit by uh, uh, the employer that they're responsible for a contract which was between uh, the builder um, and the original contractor. And in, in their argument, they say, look, we, we came into the picture um, in 1963. Uh, we are not the same contracting party with whom you have contracted. And as such, uh, go away. We, we are not responsible at common law. Uh, in court of appeal, Lord Denning, uh, in, in, in his usual fashionable uh, equity sense, said, wait a minute, <clears throat> there was a novation uh, by conduct because, um, uh, because uh, the parties knew each other and when the, uh, the material change occurred, uh, the client was informed uh, that this is happening. So that's like, what actually uh, dictated the court to uh, take such a route was uh, the novation was sought, the new subcontractor informed the original contracting party that this is happening, and by conduct, the consents were also give, given. It might, you might say like, well, you know, this, be, this before my time, it was 1969, you know, and, uh, um, uh, when I was never there, uh, but uh, you know this is the English common law, and um, very recently, uh, enterprise managed services and McFadden Utilities, uh, Lord Colson, um, he was uh, in the High Court, I believe, at that time, uh, has in a, in a, in a, in orbita uh, accepted uh, this uh, proposition that novation is perfectly possible. Uh, in, uh, via conduct as well, it's not necessary, provided the requirements are fulfilled. So if you, if you go back with less than that, look, if, 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 if a new part is discussed, I got to be careful and uh, try to make a formal novation to secure my position. And it has to be well drafted because I may not be the master of it. So that's, um, uh, that's that. And uh, <clears throat> novation in part or of part of, the, of all the obligations, yes, that's also possible. You don't have to novate a new party to take on all the obligations and the benefits. Um, um, as it happened in this case, Langston Group, the Cardiff City Football Club, uh, the, the employer, um, the, the, the portion of the contract we're talking about uh, was um, in the form of a variation. And uh, the variation, it's quite common that, uh, for example, the, the contractor uh, is now willing or not doing something 
uh, or delaying and the, the, the employer uh, in a meeting says, look, uh, I know that you're gonna get it done by XYZ subtractor. Would it be possible for you to um, uh, allow me uh, to deal with the subtractor directly? And sometimes it's helpful because uh, the contractor might say, okay, in that case, uh, I'll not be responsible under their contract. So <clears throat> there could be a variation to take out a particular part, uh, which is to be done by a specialized subcontractor and, um, uh, and, and through a variation uh, that be withdrawn and given to the new subcontractor. But if it's a tripartite tri uh, uh, variation, it could very well be a novation and a perfect example as it happened here that it doesn't have doesn't have to be always uh, for the entire contract it could be part of it and um, failure to complete a novation agreement well again normally what's the rule the maxim is equity will not help a volunteer to perfect an imperfect gift a more or less a similar rule applies in here. If you only contemplate and plan and do not execute, there won't be anyone to help you out. So if something sort of started its life and it was at the planning stage, it was never executed, please keep that in writing and informed that there isn't any innovation yet done or, uh, uh, you know, don't hesitate to inform the other party that you discussed about it, but we have never actioned it. To make it clear that in future, you are not being sued, that because this was contemplated or planned, it was done just as it was um, uh, in chat sort of enterprise managed. So you may have an ovation through conduct if in reality, the three parties uh, conducted them in a way that, in fact, they have novated uh, the original rights and obligations to a new party. You may not have it at all if you plan it and then forget to execute it. Because if your plan was to have a written novation, and then if you never execute it, you cannot argue for the other, earlier one. So whenever you see a new party is kind of um, uh, getting into your original uh, affair uh, of the original contract, please be aware that whether you are actually following the trap of an unknown novation or an implied novation. And the final one I want to discuss is reputatory breach in novation. Well, I mean, if you have, um, uh, you have uh, had a contract which says you got to no, uh, consent to novation uh, and you don't, that might very well be a repudiatory breach, you know. So that's, that's that I wanted to, because, you know, I'm a man of adjudication, for adjudication, by adjudication, of adjudication. And all my um, thoughts, uh, when I look uh, into the terms of a contract revolves around what happens in an adjudication. So I wanted to, at the end or towards this, the end slide, last slide of uh, this morning, want to discuss novation in the context of adjudication. If an original contract is, uh, there is a novation of an original contract to a new party, then obviously you cannot um, uh, sue uh, the original party. And uh, there might be uh, problems where uh, you have not uh, properly uh, novated the new party to uh, uh, the party who continued in the, in the affairs. Uh, and as such, if the new party wants to bring an adjudication, uh, he might receive a jurisdictional challenge that well, you are not my contracting party. Although uh, the, the, um, the performance is received very well from him and there were dealings with him, but uh, the normal, normal uh, jurisdictional challenge would be that this party has never been novated, so he cannot bring the adjudication. I had this 
as far as I remember, there's only one case law uh, against it regarding the Devonshire County Council. That's not what is important in my discussion, but I'll give you the other case where I was involved um, as a party representative and then in the High Court uh, enforcing uh, my client's um, uh, adjudication award uh, decision uh, given by a very renowned adjudicator of the country. It was about seven years or five years ago. Uh, this was, um, this was uh, Rob Parton treading as uh, whatever that was, I forgot, uh, uh, v Kilka Projects Limited. And this was number one. There was actually a number two as well, in which I was um, uh, involved as well uh, for entirely different thing, um, uh, which is in the line of Grove and all these. But number one, okay, um, um, which was uh, Rob Parson trading as, I think, Richard Interiors Limited, uh, the Kilka projects. Now, in this case, what actually happened, Mr. Rob Parson, my client, uh, entered into a contract with Kilka projects for doing some interior job uh, in a famous London hotel. And uh, when they were progressing well into the contract, Mr. Rob Parson converted his um, organization to a limited company called Richard Interiors Limited. I now remember the name. Yes, Richard Interiors Limited. And um, uh, that was kind of, uh, he informed uh, the, uh, the contractor Kilka projects and uh, they had in their contemplation that they will do an ovation and uh, Kilka projects kept on dealing with Richard Interiors they uh, honored the applications from Richard Interiors Limited, paid the money into Richard Interiors Limited. Um, the, the VAT number was transferred as well. And then there was a final account dispute from Mr. Rob Parton. And uh, we succeeded in the adjudication to use uh, Richard Interior as an agent. We simply said uh, to the adjudicator, that um, we never had an ovation and the parties understood and dealt with uh, the new party as an agent. And uh, Rob Parson has given a witness statement that I allowed my company to act as my agent of the original contract between me and the uh, Kilka projects. And uh, the Kilka has accepted that uh, proposition by conduct. So an ovation was raised at the point of adjudication and that, uh, well, either the contract was transferred to Richard Interiors, so the Richard Interiors is the party and Richard Interior cannot be a party because uh, we had the original contract with Rob Parson and no formal novation has ever happened. And we have successfully argued that uh, the original contract was never novated, although there were discussions as to that. Uh, and um, uh, the, rather we entered into a um, uh, uh, relationship of agency and I allowed and employed Richard Interiors, Mr. Rob Parton's argument uh, to deal with uh, the employer uh, on my behalf for the rest of the project and the employer by his dealings has accepted that. So there is no issue of novation here. The honorable adjudicator accepted it and uh, the uh, High Court TCC also accepted uh, that proposition when, it, um, uh, when the, when the uh, decision of the adjudicator was challenged. Uh, the reason why it's fresh in my memory, although it's been five years, that only three, four months ago, the same argument was tendered before me. Uh, by a party when I was sitting as an adjudicator, and I momentarily thought, well, I know what to do. So um, I think that's it uh, from me this morning. Thank you very much once again for being present right from the beginning till the end. And if you have any questions, I will humbly try to answer them. Thank you very much. Well, we do indeed have some questions. Um, someone's asking, regarding novation, if the design is up to and including stage four, and then novated to the contractor, which then results in failings in the stage four design. I couldn't hear you. Would you repeat, please? Sorry. 
Regarding the novation, if the design is up to and including stage four and then mm. novated to the contractor, which then results in failings in the stage four design, does the risk of cost and time lie purely on the contractor or can this be recoverable either through the employer or through the designer's PI? Answer is very simple. Whatever you write on your novation agreement, as I say, you are completely free to write your own fate. There isn't a pre-existing, and even if there is a decision which says so, it's not any way binding if you vary it or the implication of the decision, if you vary it in a carefully drafted contract to, to, to dictate what's gonna be the fate of what. Because okay. you are the contracting party, you are the one who can kind of dictate your fate. And uh, if you don't know how to, as I said earlier, you know who to come to. Okay. Can, so. um, another question here, can you prevent novation of a contract if your account is not up to date? Sorry, I missed it again. Can you prevent novation of a contract if your account is not up to date? Uh, well, I mean, where, where you can stop a novation agreement being um, uh, entered into is simple, um, uh, simple, is all depends on uh, what you have uh, consented to at the beginning, as I said. Say, for instance, the, the, the first thing happens is between the professional and the employer. Now, if the, if, the, uh, uh, if the original contract says that, as and when you are called uh, for a novation, you have to give your consent freely and without any objection and, 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 and with any other problems with, within your contract, be it a repudiatory breach on the part of the employer or not, your hands are tied. So it's, it's kind of an obligation, which again, if I draft the regional professional services contract for the employer, I include all these difficult clauses uh, against this professional. And if I do it for the professional uh, service provider, I just simply say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna agree to this. I will only allow novation if my accounts are up to date. Okay. Someone else is asking, could you please explain about Novation Ab Initio and Novation Switch with a scenario? Well, I mean, it will take slightly more time, if I may. Uh, I think it's Smith, uh, Smith uh, Hindu. Um, uh, so if I may, if you could send me uh, an email, I will give you a comprehensive answer with examples so that it becomes clearer to you. Okay, and then one final question here. Um, someone's saying, an assignment is a transfer recognised under law of a right or obligation of one person to another. Assignment differs from novation in so much that the parties to the contract do not change. Most rights and obligations are capable of assignment. May I ask, is this the correct understanding? Thank you. Well, to some extent, yes, you are correct. Um, uh, so, uh, most rights and obligations are capable of assignment. Uh, there isn't any problem, but at common law, as I repeatedly said during the presentation, uh, you can only, uh, or you, you are normally assumed to have only assigned the benefits, not the obligation. So, obligations do not, as a matter of law, transfers. Uh, under an assignment. But again, there isn't a harm or there isn't a, a, a legal bar for you to call an agreement an assignment. And uh, then um, uh, the, the burden to pass as well. And uh, there, are, there are occasions where in equity, the burden passes regardless what you have said. But the problem is, if you do not make uh, it a tri-party contract, then um, a tri-party contract, in that case, the problem is that 
you'll have a problem in, uh, in privity of contract. Because if you assign your part to somebody, then uh, the other party cannot reach that somebody or that somebody cannot reach the other part. You know, you're the one through which they have to deal. So you will, you will, you will continue to be in there. Uh, common law, that's the position. So, uh, so that's, that's the reason why novation is preferred when both uh, burdens and obligations are transferred, if that answers your question. Okay, and someone else here is asking, if there are any changes in the latter stage, is this accepted as a supplementary agreement and will come in as part of the contract agreement? Well, it depends. We have um, a full kind of circle. It's slightly off track a question for novation, but let's, let's discuss it because it has some, some relevance. The point is that um, the Americans, they, they take a position or took a position all alone since 70s that if the, the, the freedom of bargain and the sanctity of the party's ability the concept of the philosophical concept that you can carry on uh, with your new new situation if that's the freedom of contract freedom of the parties to enter or dictate their own fate then why would um, uh, a contractual term which was written earlier and the parties wanted to vary and supplement it through their conduct and discussion be bothering you know uh, uh, that they can't do it is this the court's uh, uh, obligation to, to bring out the old uh, written uh, part of an agreement. The court in, in US felt, no, that's not the case. Now, interestingly, in a remarkable judgment in nine, back in 1989, Lord Diplock delivering the, the, the leading one, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, the case is so famous that it has a nickname called Hannah Blumenthal. In, uh, in a case where there was an agreement to arbitrate in writing in a particular way, and parties in complete disregard of the written provision of the comprehensive written contract and which says that you cannot vary the contract without a written agreement and blah, blah, um, uh, went and discussed together and went to uh, arbitrate and follow a procedure uh, which has got nothing to do or not similar to the, the one they have agreed earlier. And up, the case went, went up to the House of Lords and following the American doctrine, uh, Lord Diplock said, yeah, I'm, I'm not here to destroy uh, the things that has been changed over time just because it was done in conduct and not written into the original book. The parties mustn't have uh, thought that that particular clause which says that you cannot change the contract in writing unless it's in writing, uh, they must have thought is not any more applicable for this case. Okay, now between 1989 and to 2016, the lawyers continuously uh, sort of kept on arguing that, no, 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 this should be changed, this should be changed, this should be changed. And 2016, the UK Supreme Court has changed the course again. They say, look, if there is an existing contract, which is comprehensive and in writing, and unless there is very clear um, evidence that the, call, the, the parties have decided to vary it by conduct, the normal rule of construction would be, we will go to the original contract and will honor the earlier bargain. Otherwise, there won't be any certainty. People will write the book and then forget it totally. So the current situation is, if there is a supplement uh, or a change, there has to be brought in. The word change is not that much uh, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in contra law. It's, it's a variation and if the original contract prescribes a process uh, that you can only vary in writing, then you'll have to follow it. So be, be, be careful. If there is a change, the best advice is, and in construction, please formalize it. And if you do not have a bi-party formalization process written, then if you are a contractor, write it down that a contractor's variation uh, proposal will be deemed as accepted uh, if made in writing and properly uh, after a certain period of time. If you are an employer, do the same for yourself. 
that's great. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mohammed, for your expertise and time this morning. Thank you to everyone that's attending. Um, that uh, seems to wrap up the session as we've uh, finished our questions. So if anyone's interested, we've got um, tomorrow night our construction uh, roundup panel, which will include Mohammed, along with uh, John Sharp and Richard Silver. If you'd like a space on that, I'll log into that. Please email seminars at silverllp.com and I'll get that sorted for you. Um, in the meantime, it merely remains for me to say thank you very much. Just, again, just to supplement, Julie, tomorrow, yeah. um, I'm going to discuss, that's my plan, I'm going to discuss uh, claims post COVID. So right. um, I, I, uh, I have been facing similar situations and clients requests and briefs. So uh, if you are interested, if you are in England, uh, it's a good time to listen to that. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Mohammed. Well, so uh, thank you everyone, have a great day. Enjoy what appears to be the last of the sunshine for a couple of days. And we will hopefully see you all tomorrow evening at six o'clock for the construction roundup. Thank you. Bye.